Here we go. Just gonna just gonna grab my gear. Gonna grab my gear. Not gonna get distracted. Not gonna not, not gonna get distracted and not gonna get distracted by uh, it's you. It's you, you giant domain mural. You enigmatic piece of random symbolism tossed on a huge glowing rock. I hate you so much. Look at it, it's just, just, just taunting me. Taunting me with your secrets. What does it mean? What does it mean? The eyes, the owl, the wheat, the blue lines. What does it mean? Actually, you know what? No, I, I, I don't wanna know. I don't wanna know why those eyes are staring at me or what this big ass circle thing is or why you're in literally every single domain ever or why your triketra is broken or whatever the heck that stupid symbol is supposed to be. I'm just gonna ignore you completely. I'm gonna come in, spend my resin, take my gear and go. I'm not gonna look at you, not gonna think about you. Nope, I'm just gonna go enjoy my game, enjoy my de-stress time. I'm gonna beat up some hella churls and I'm not gonna think about the mural. I'm not gonna think about this big old rock wall. Not gonna think about all the symbolism and the carvings and the stupid owl and... Damn it. Okay, show of hands. I want to know how many of you have spent any length of time in any domain staring at this stupid wall and I'll just assume you raised your hands because this is a video and I can't see you anyway. I, at least, have spent many farming sessions trying not to look at this thing, but it's just so hard. I mean, just look at it. It's packed with symbolism. It just has to mean something, right? But what? What could it mean? Well, I'm here to tell you that the answer is much simpler than you'd think, but no less interesting than you'd think. Okay, uh, disclosure time. This is a theory video, which means that the views contained within are mine and mine alone, and are not necessarily true within the game. While I will be referencing a lot of canon lore to justify my theory, the theory itself should always be taken with a grain of salt and never assumed to be canon. I see that happen too many times with theory videos. So that's my disclosure. End disclosure. Now, I've been musing over the meaning of this tablet since the game's launch, and I'd honestly thought I had a really good interpretation of the tablet's true meaning until very recently. So recently, in fact, that you can actually see an oversimplified summary of my thoughts on it at the very end of my domain video. Link in the description. As it turns out, I overthought things. A lot. The real meaning behind the domain tablet is a lot simpler and honestly a lot cooler than my original idea. You see, the domain tablet is actually a literal visual representation of the Emerald Tablet. Pause for effect. If you don't know what the Emerald Tablet is, you're not alone, but you've probably heard one of its most iconic lines, as above, so below. This was the line that brought to my attention the possible connection to the Domain Tablet. The Emerald Tablet is a 12,000 year old alchemical text allegedly carved on a single slab of emerald. I say allegedly because the original Emerald Tablet was lost and only its translations and transcriptions remain. Its writing is attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, or Hermes the Thrice Great, but in reality this was just a name the Greeks gave the Egyptian god Thoth. It's considered the source of all alchemy and is much older than the Western practices of turning metal into gold that we're familiar with. It was a lot more like spiritual chemistry in ancient Egypt, so keep that in mind. Now, all that said, most alchemical texts were structured like a recipe and still are because there is such things as contemporary alchemists, which is something I also just learned. So you get the recipe, you follow the instructions, use the correct ingredients, and you get a specific result. It's just like cooking, but with things you really shouldn't eat. But the Emerald Tablet is really different. It describes not a recipe, but a process or methodology by which one can make anything. 
and everything. And it's considered the foundation of all alchemy. In fact, most alchemists displayed a translation or transcription of the emerald tablet on the walls of their laboratories. So if contemporary alchemists proudly displayed the foundation of their practice close to where they practiced, it would stand to reason that the ancient alchemists in Tavat would do the same. Now I will argue that the Irminsul represents the source of all alchemical power in Tevat since they appear to regulate the ley lines and the ley lines power all alchemical transmutations. For that reason, we can essentially consider the area in which the Irminsul are found to be the equivalent of a Tevat alchemist's laboratory. And on the wall of every domain, without fail, is the domain tablet. Tevat's Emerald Tablet. And when you look at the actual text of the Emerald Tablet, the mysteries of the Domain Tablet begin to unravel. Now there are a lot of different translations, and while they are all essentially of having the same meaning, I thought I'd select one that was a little easier to digest. The one I have selected is by Idris Shah. Oh, and uh, pay attention while I read this, as I'll be highlighting areas of interest on the Domain Tablet as I go. The truth, certainty, truest, without untruth. What is above is like what is below. What is below is like what is above. The miracle of unity is to be attained. Everything is formed from the contemplation of unity, and all things come about from unity, by means of adaptation. Its parents are the sun and the moon. It was born by the wind and nurtured by the earth, Every wonder is from it, and its power is complete. Throw it upon the earth, and the earth will separate from fire, the impalpable separated from the palpable. Through wisdom it rises slowly from the world to heaven, then it descends to the world, combining the power of the upper and the lower. Thus you will have the illumination of all the world, and darkness will disappear. This is the power of all strength, it overcomes that which is delicate and penetrates through solids. This was the means of the creation of the world, and in the future wonderful developments will be made, and this is the way. I am Hermes, the threefold sage, so named because I hold the three elements of all wisdom, and thus ends the revelation of the work of the sun. Reading through the many Emerald Tablet translations was enough to convince me that the Tablet Within Domains is definitely supposed to be the Emerald Tablet itself, or at least a representation of it. In fact, it may even be describing the fundamentals of Chemia. This assumption leads to some interesting possibilities. For example, the rooms within domains… these aren't altars, they're some sort of laboratory. Transmutation rooms, specifically. In that context, a lot of the design choices start to make sense. The ornate floors may have originally functioned as transmutation circles, and the pillars perhaps a continuation of it, extending upwards with runic carvings to create an enclosed space. Heck, even the Irminsul has a possible transmutation circle on it. Just watch. See how the design changes when I offer resin? It might be because we're transmuting the resin in some way into artifacts by offering it to the tree. Is this chemia? Are we actually performing chemia when we do this? Well, we very well might be. But we'll get to that. Let's circle back to the domain tablet for a minute. I actually want to cover some of the symbolism here as it's actually kind of cool and a little enlightening. Let's start in the middle because it seems like that's an obvious place to start. The Emerald Tablet references the creation of the world, and wisdom rising from the world to heaven, so the first assumption is that this is supposed to represent the world. It is, but it isn't. It just, um, more on this later. This was not a good place to start. Anyway, moving slightly up, you'll see a spiralized symbol known as a Triskel. This is an incredibly ancient Irish symbol that is supposed to represent the three worlds, the physical, the celestial, and the spiritual. I'm actually going to call this symbol the one that represents the world and its three forms. So why are there two, one up top and one below? Well, remember, as above, 
so below. This applies to all of the symbols, and we'll get to why this is important a little bit later. For now, just bear with me. Next, we see a helix-like shape emerging from the Earth, perhaps representing the wisdom slowly moving up to heaven, and conversely, on the bottom half of the tablet, the same wisdom descending back down towards the Earth so as to combine with what is above to what is below. In some interpretations and in some uh, older alchemical drawings, this is actually represented by intertwined snakes, which I will also show you a little bit later. Anyway, now let's look at the eyes on the left of right, because they're a little bit tricky. I think this one is taken a little less literally from the tablet and more so from the seven principles of alchemy, which is often drawn as something that looks a little bit like this. You see that eye in the center? That's what I'm talking about. That eye in the center may have been the inspiration for the symbol itself, which interestingly enough, has been adopted as the personal symbol as the sustainer of heavenly principles and is present on all of her cubes. It's fascinating to note that the sustainer of heavenly principles may take her title from the seven principles of alchemy. So why only six eyes? I'm not entirely sure, but it's possible this figure looking symbol in the center may represent the seventh. Or it may represent something else entirely, but I don't really want to get into it right now, so for now, we'll just take this at face value. Anyway, above the little figure is a triketra, a symbol everyone here should be quite familiar with, as it is quite literally everywhere in-game, from Mora to Paimon, to ancient ruins, to Genesis crystals. It, it's everywhere, it's, it's everywhere. Now, while typically it's a symbol of the moon, its meaning here is not quite so clear cut since one corner is broken. It looks even stranger with all those squiggly lines, but truthfully, those squigglies were commonly used in a variant of the alchemical symbol for the moon. The broken side here may indicate that the moon isn't what it appears to be, but I lack the information needed to make a proper conjecture here. Again, that's probably something to look at in a completely different video. Now this next symbol is really fun because it doesn't really look like anything until you flip it upside down. Then you can quite clearly see the stylized depiction of an owl as a symbol for wisdom, or maybe even hidden wisdom. And above that at the very top? Well, at first I thought it was a depiction of the different positions of the moon during an eclipse, but then I realized it's actually something called the Gnostic Circle. Take a look for yourself. And yeah, okay, I know there's one extra point on the Gnostic Circle, but if you connect those two bottom points, you get effectively the same symbol as the one on the Domain Tablet. So what about those circles on either side? Well, those might look like eyes at first glance, but I don't know that two different symbols for eyes would be used in one tablet. Rather, they kind of look a little like a 2D depiction of an armillary sphere which I may or may not have been calling an astrolabe for an entire video, see the link below. Uh, the terms are kind of interchangeable, but our millery sphere is more accurate, so we're gonna go with that. All right, with the detailed analysis out of the way, let's take a look at some early drawings from hermetic texts that also tried to put the words of the Emerald Tablet into some form of visual codex. Place these side by side, and the likeness becomes very clear. This is true even in more modern interpretations or reimaginings. We have a lot of common symbolism even in the same locations, from the twisting snakes to the crowns to the choice of a bird close to heaven. But none of these are mirrored in the same way that the domain tablet is, and I think that makes sense because these illustrations are meant to be read both from top to bottom and from bottom to top, thus not needing to be mirrored. Now remember that this tablet is only ever seen alongside an Earmansoul, which is closely connected to the world tree. But what if there was another name by which we could call this tree? Since it regulates the ley lines in the same way the heart regulates blood, which gives us life, could we then call it the tree of life? Let's hop religions for a moment because believe it or not, Hermetic Alchemy, which has the most connections to Gnostic theology upon which Genshin is based, has a lot of overlap with the teachings of the Kabbalah. 
I won't dive too deeply into why and how this happened, but basically, the principles of both Hermetic Alchemy and the Kabbalah had so much in common that alchemists began to borrow symbolism and lessons from it. This led to a type of merger, if you will, but we're specifically only going to talk about Kabbalah's Tree of Life. Now, Kabbalah is complicated, deeply spiritual, and important to many people, so I won't pretend to be an expert. I'm only here to provide the cliff notes as it relates to Genshin, and I will probably miss a lot of the subtle nuances as I go. Any deeper understandings of Kabbalah will have to come from your own personal research. That's my disclaimer. Anyway... The Tree of Life is a metaphorical tree composed of 10 sephirotes, which are organized into three triads, and can be likened to the alchemical principles. I mention the triads specifically because we often see this recurring triketra pattern, and while it's generally a symbol of the moon, I also think it may be a reference to three triads within the Tree of Life. Hear me out on this. The first triad includes the sephirot Keter, Bina, and Hokma. Keter represents absolute divinity. Hokma is likened to a seed of creation, and Bina is that which makes the growth of Hokma possible. I'm going to call this triad the triad of creation. The second triad is made of Hesed, Gebera, and Tiferet. Hesed is the embodiment of law and order. Gebera carries out that law, and Tiferet promotes unity, reconciliation, or the process of ascending and descending. Interestingly enough, Geburah has also been called the enforcer of principles. I'll call this the triad of law. Now the third triad contains Netzach, Hod, and Yesod, and are the Sephirot closest to Earth. Netzach represents possibilities, Hod represents thoughts, and Yesod represents emotions we'll call this the triad of man. At this point, you might notice that there are 10 sephirot, but only three triads, leaving one lonely sephirot at the bottom of the tree. This sephirot is Malkuth, the beginning of life. Now, something interesting happens when we overlay the tree of life on top of the emerald tablet. While the placement isn't totally perfect, it's very interesting to note which triad falls where. The triad of creation overlaps the symbols representing heaven, while the triad of law overlaps the triketra, owl, and strange little winged person that appears to be ascending, which, by the way, falls immediately beneath Tiferet, which governs the process of ascending and descending. And then we have the triad of man that lays over the triskel and the ascension markings beneath the winged person. And then we have Malkuth landing squarely on top of the disc I've been avoiding talking about this entire time. So let's do that. Because if you thought we were already in the rabbit hole, you are sorely mistaken. We're only just now getting into that. Now I've seen a lot of suggestions about what this disc is, mostly because it's the most mechanical, simplistic, and not very artistic element on this entire mural. But it's arguably the most important thing here. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say this is the entire reason the Traveler is in Tevat. I think this symbol represents the Genesis Pearl. But Ash, that's a square, you say. No, that's a rune. Ingas, specifically. This rune generally represents the action of creation, evolution, and genesis, but most often it just means seed. Now I know what you're thinking. Why on earth would I liken the genesis pearl to a rune that means seed? Well, first off, seed is just the easiest way to conceptualize the act of creating something from a formless source. That's why Ingus also means creation, and creation is synonymous with Genesis, and the only thing we have that connects to Genesis is the Genesis Pearl. Also consider the idioms planting the seed of an idea or a pearl of wisdom. <laughs> now, while I recognize that a pearl is not a seed because it doesn't actually grow into anything, I think that pearl in this case is actually referring to how it appears, not what it's made of. Meaning it is likely a perfect white sphere that may radiate some sort of rainbow-ish aura, or it may be somewhat silvery white in perfectly smooth, I think. And this 
is a leap, but I've been thinking for some time, wondering where the Irminsul and the World Tree actually come from. And since the Irminsul at least appear as literal trees that produce fruit, see my fall sky video for more info on that, I think it's safe to assume that they may also sprout from a seed. If not the smaller Irminsul, which may simply be the result of something like a taproot, but plants at some point come from a seed, right? Given the Irminsul and the Genesis Pearl are both silvery white, we assume, is it not then possible that the Genesis Pearl is really just an Irminsul seed? Why else would something so simple as a Pearl be so important as to be shown to us every single time the battle pass resets? Why did some ancient civilization send not one but two heirs to reclaim it? Why is Venti telling us this story? There are a few other places where pearls are mentioned explicitly that I'd like to take a look at. Let's start with the first one that comes to mind, the solar pearl. The in-game description reads, a dull golden pearl made of an unknown substance that harbors the power of the light of the sun and the moon and pulses with a warm strength. Now the emerald tablet has a line that reads, its parents are the sun and the moon. So perhaps the pearl is considered a child of the sun and the moon, inheriting both cosmic powers and combining them into something new, perhaps? In fact, this might actually be the case because in alchemy, this child of the sun and the moon is commonly known as the Phileus Philosophorum, or the philosopher's child. This term is also used to describe the philosopher's stone, the elixir of life, the child of wisdom, the child of the egg, the water of life, and most notably, the living stone. Now the stone is often illustrated as a perfect sphere being protected by a snake or an Ouroboros. But note the shape and overall design. It's a perfect sphere surrounded by several floating rings. It's definitely not the only catalyst with this design aesthetic. In fact, this is a very common catalyst design for non-book type catalysts. This list includes the Emerald Orb, the Memory of Dust, Twin Nephrite, Black Cliff Agate, Frostbearer, and the Prototype Amber as a version 1.6. I'm sure we'll get more to fit this list, but for now, this is what we have. There are some very odd parallels between these catalysts, and I won't go through them all, but I will highlight a select few, starting with a line from the Eye of Perception, which reads, This pearl is nature's very quintessence. Only one whose heart is clear can use it. This description is in sharp contrast from the ones that follow. The Memory of Dust claims its endless transformations reveal the power within. Black Cliff Agate has an ominous crimson glow that seems to pulse in synchronization with the tremors from deep within the earth, and that the core purum seems to wax and wane like a crimson moon, growing steadily brighter and then steadily darker in a never-ending cycle as if to give forewarning of imminent tectonic activity, while referencing the fury of the earth's core. The frost bearer, on the other hand, is called a fruit, not a pearl, but it says a faint sense of agony emanates from it. Incidentally, you can get this catalyst from the frost bearing tree, which is widely agreed upon by the theorist community to be a type of Irminsul tree, thus making this catalyst a product of the Irminsul fruit. What's interesting is that part of the weapon's description is written as if it's being told from the perspective of the tree itself. Which makes the final line quite ominous. To the one who can render recompense upon this poisonous world shall it go, and may they carry my innocent, bitter fruit as they enact justice. That's coming from a tree. And speaking of a crimson moon, there's a line about the pearl within the book Breeze Amidst the Forest. In Atra's sun befell its kingdom, and a luminous pearl lost its glow. Nivea's silk grew dim, and wheat and gold burned brilliantly no more. So begins another tale that occurred in the lost Conria kingdom. The Eclipse dynasty had fallen, and disaster spread across the land. 
this ties pearls to the cataclysm of Conria, an event that surely would have been rife with pain, anger, and bitterness. Those memories would have been sucked into the ley lines, perhaps joining with the ilk of Sol Vindigmir's fall, and every civilization before that. So where am I going with all of this? Well, if we liken the fruit of the Frostbearer to the pearls of the other catalysts, the only visual difference is that the Frostbearer's fruit has an unrefined shape. So what happens when you peel away the flesh of a fruit? Well, you're left with a seed or two. But we've only ever seen Earmensel fruit. We've never seen an Earmensel seed. At least, not by that name. Now, if Earmensel fruit are made of memories, it would make sense that the seeds would be similar, hypothetically. But seeds also differ from fruit because fruit don't grow into anything new, only seeds do. And since seeds are the source of life, and given that these catalysts seem to describe the pearl as having a deep connection to the core of the earth, well, this is really something to go into in another video when we look deeper into Teyvat's world structure, but for now, let's assume that the core of the earth isn't a molten ball of magma, but instead a highly concentrated ball of ley line energy, the source of all energy. Now, what entity interacts with the ley line energy more than any other? The Irminsul, which now appears to be capable of sentient thought, although it also seems incapable of acting on those thoughts from what we can gather from the Frostbearer's depiction of events. And I can't help but wonder if the Irminsul not only houses the memories of everything within the ley lines, but also considers those memories to belong to them or it in... Yeah. Like, whatever goes into the ley lines is now a memory belonging to the Irminsul. And if that's the case, then it sounds like the Irminsul may be angry, bitter, and furious, but at what? Well, the Irminsul that we've seen so far are also known as petrified trees, and I don't know about you, but I don't know of any petrified trees that are alive it's then possible that the world tree as we know it is dying or dead, and in order to save this world of Tevat, a new tree may be needed. For that, we'll probably need a new seed. And not just any seed, we'll need the ultimate seed, or rather, the ultimate pearl, the Genesis Pearl, the seed that houses the most power and has the greatest connection to the world tree, found at the world center, or the core. To support this hypothesis, let's go back to the Sephirot. Now Malkuth, governing over the Earth, falls right over what I'm calling the Genesis Pearl, and thus would represent all of Tevat coming forth into being from a seed. But not just Tevat, but the world beneath Tevat. The world in which Conria was found. See, there's this thing about the Tree of Life where it can be mirrored and overlaid on top of itself. This is called the Tree of Death, composed of the Clefote instead of the Sephirot. Interestingly enough for us, the Domain Tablet is also mirrored. As above, so below, right? The important thing to note here is that the earthly Sephirot and the earthly Clefote actually overlap each other when the trees are displayed together. This really helps illustrate the Emerald Tablet's idea of one continuous loop of ascension and descension, and it's like the Earth itself, caught in an endless cycle of death, life, and rebirth in between, all surrounding this seed, or core. This cycle is often represented by a serpent coiling around the tree. Note too that the serpent is also what's guarding the Genesis Pearl, or maybe the serpent is preventing the Genesis Pearl from being found. It's hard to say. But that might sound familiar to you, because earlier we talked about the Ouroboros, which was guarding the Philosopher's Child, also known as the Pearl. In Norse mythology, the great serpent Nidhogg gnaws at the roots of the world tree and causes it harm, but in turn, the tree's roots imprison the serpent. And thus, the two are stagnant. Is it 
possible that a great serpent or a great evil is being held in place by the world tree? And because of that imprisonment, the tree is unable to be reborn? Is that serpent holding the key to rebirth a hostage? Show me the truth of this world, Rhine daughter said to a young Albedo. What could she have meant by that? Is it possible that Rhine daughter knew the truth and wanted Albedo to discover it for himself? Or did she believe that she was incapable of learning the truth and thus entrusted the task to her only pupil? Were there constant trips into the depths of the earth and to the domains of Tevat simply to study the emerald tablet? To try and decipher the truth? Or was there a deeper meaning to those ventures? Maybe one day we'll learn the truth for ourselves. Until then, I want to hear what you think. Am I on to something with the Emerald Tablet connections? Is the center circle really the Genesis put? Wait, 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 don't answer that. At least not until I go into the topic more in depth in another video. We'll be talking about the Genesis Pearl in detail and what it might mean for the structure of the world of Tevat. I guarantee this is a world structure theory you have not seen before. But until then, this is Ashakai signing out.